Parashah Bo, it starts in the book of Shemot, chapter 10 through 13, and obviously we heard from uh, the readings in the book of Jeremiah. There are several references that we can go about in the Brit HaDashah, which includes Mark, obviously, because his pastor was in the middle of this, Mark, Luke, and John, as it was read. So let's just cover a little bit about what the outline is all about. This Torah portion covers what's left of the strokes that were brought against Egypt. Okay, so it starts with the eighth plague, goes through these uh, series of last three strokes against Egypt um, that we discounted. Actually, it was on sale, and we bump it up to 12, and we discounted it back to 10 this morning. It was a typo. <laughs> it was a typo. But it's actually 10 plagues, as you see here. The last plague, then we go right into the Passover lamb, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and here comes the death of the firstborn. There's what was promised. Here is deliver, and then the exodus, and the actual commandment to observe the Passover and the consecration of the firstborn. This is all in this Torah portion. There is a lot of things to pull here from. And we'll be here all day. And most of the time, the focus goes right to that center here. And that associated feast of Passover that goes with it. We're just going to look at a, a couple of uh, different points this afternoon. Okay. But first, let's just briefly go what we went through last week. Last week, we dealt... With Moshe's calling and his return to Mizraim, Egypt, now under the command of that name, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we learn about his revelation under that name, Moshe putting Moshe in a different level, unlike the forefathers. He was the prototypical redeemer. We discuss of how God reminded the Bene Israel of his covenants and the reassurance that he will make it come to pass. And it will take a series of events to show both the Egyptians and the Israelites how he basically delivers the essence of who he is and his sovereignty. The ultimate outcome is Israel will be returned to the Lamb, promised to his forefathers, and will dwell there peacefully. And so far, some of these strokes have been delivered to Egypt. With at least three of those included Goshen, the lower Egypt, and land inhabited by the Hebrews. Okay, that's where we left off last week. Now, the famous phrase, Bo, come, as it says there, or go, it's another way of putting it. But actually, you're going to see it here in the Hebrew. How many can see that? Because it's kind of far back there. But it says, Vayomer Adonai el Moshe. The two letters there, the bet and the aleph is Bo, el Farao, ki ani. And you see this word here in blue that we're going to be discussing. And it's going to become very evident today in this Torah portion why we serve a just God. And that his ways are beyond our own comprehensions. They're not unlike our ways. Here we will also see the essence of his redemptive nature for his most precious creation, which is his people. So this is the establishment here in this Torah portion of the pattern of deliverance that will return on what the prophet Joel says in chapter 2, the great and terrible day of the Lord. The question is, very important question, so follow me. How many are watching the Super Bowl tomorrow? They say, where did that come from? A lot of people, this weekend is about the Super Bowl, isn't it? They can't breathe, they can't think, they wear every color on, under the rainbow that matches their respected teams. And even if their team's not in it, they're fanatical about it, right? 
And for the last two weeks, they've been preparing for it. So there's a buildup. A buildup. Just like the earth has been building up and it's shaking everywhere. Amen. See? There's a buildup. So that's just a reference today of what is important about a preparation or about an anticipation. Yes. Here in Egypt, there's also been a lot of preparations taking place. We already went through, what, 430 years of the sons of Yaakov being down in Egypt in exile, assimilated, falling into idolatry, and finding themselves in bondage. They are under the control of... Pharaoh, take that out and put Hasatan, their equivalent. Why? Because you're talking always, I taught you to think here on earth and outside of time and space, much bigger thing. Yeshua, when he taught, he elevated things to show you that the pattern is Starts with the physical, but it has a much more greater effect. And it is under this ruler, the ruler of the world, named here Pharaoh, that they were being afflicted. And it's at that time that they had to cry out, to cry out on the merit of their forefathers, despite their falling out to the Lord to deliver them. Now, what is Hashem going to respond after all this buildup, after all this preparation, after all they've gone through, Hashem himself knew this was going to happen because he does exit outside of time and space. So he had foretold this from coming, promises that he made to Abraham Avinu, and the stage is set for maturity to be fulfilled. And now we're going to, he's going to harvest it. He says, Then Hashem raised up a redeemer and a person of who? You saw him in the last oral portion, Moshe. Moshe, the great prophet who is under the guidance of Hashem, and he is his authority on earth. Do you understand that? Moshe is Hashem's authority on earth going up against whose authority? I just mentioned Pharaoh. There we go. Making the connection. Now, the last few weeks of the Torah portion, we see that this is an exchange that has been taking place between these two forces. The forces of good and the forces of evil. And not unlike today, for they are the same forces that are still in play and really active among us. So, with that in mind, let's just read just the first couple of verses here of Exodus chapter 10 and just break down this verse. Although I said to Moshe, bow to Pharaoh, go to Pharaoh and have made him, I have made him and his servants hard-hearted so that I can demonstrate these signs of mine among them. Start with that one. Very few, first few words here. Bo can mean go or come. But there is, from these multiple definitions, I like a few that say something like to be introduced is one. To attain something. To bring near. And this last one, or to attack. 
So you can say, and I'm going to quote it in plain English. Parents can relate to this. When you call your kid and say, come on, darling. Or you say, come right now. Same word. Different connotation. This is what the Sayers teaches. There are other times when he has said, Bo, go to Pharaoh. But I just stated, it's coming down the stretch. And this Bo is going to mean, now it's on. You reach the maturity of the transgression. So, some might suggest that this entering here, found here in verse 1, is of being brought near, a perspective in order to issue some sort of warning by Moshe to Pharaoh. Listen, I'm just going to warn him. How many warnings did he need? He's been warning him for the last seven. So I don't think so. Maybe. But he's received warnings. Others suggest that this is just an exercise of futility. For Moshe has approached Pharaoh in other occasions, and he has not relented. This approach is merely a reminder to Pharaoh, you are going to be defeated. Remember who Pharaoh is. So if Moshe had to remind Pharaoh, how much more you have to remind him, you are going to be defeated. See? You have to take that in. He is using it. And I just said Moshe is the authority of Hashem on earth. Under whose authority you are? That authority given to you by Yeshua has to be exercised. Okay? And he said, just as Pharaoh dreaded the approach of coming to Moshe to his court, Satan, Hasatan, fears the coming of the Messiah. So your word should be, Bo Yeshua, Bo Yeshua, Bo Yeshua. See, every time that the Pharaoh in your life comes and says, you can't go, Bo Yeshua. See, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like to be reminded. He knows he's defeated, but are you going to allow him to keep you in bondage? And you read in verse 2, so that you can tell your sons and grandsons about what I did to Egypt and about my signs that I demonstrated among them. And so that you will all know that I am Adonai. And we talked about that before. So we go from, I am going to meet Pharaoh. And we know this is going to be an encounter unlike all the other ones. This is not a warning. And even Pharaoh perceived it, right? Did he say, come back, sure, come back? No, he said otherwise. If I see your face, I'm going to take you out. He knew it. And it says here, this term here in the blue. I think it was... Uh, Aaron, read this. Akabati. Now, this is a very interesting term to put here because it's got some very interesting roots. Before I get into that, in this event here, you see something that not only is setting the clock and is setting a standard of what happened not only to this generation and what's going to be remembered through all the generations. 
as you will find later in this Torah portion. But these are just like the birth pangs of what ultimately is going to happen. And you know what that is, the exodus, the redemption from Egypt. In order to expect to Hashem's outcome, there were these series of elements taking place. So the stubborn Pharaoh, as we know it, with this heart that was not made of stone, because otherwise he wouldn't be able to have blood pumping through him. His heart was really, this is idiomatic, his heart was really full of pride. His heart was arrogant. His heart was unrepentant. Oh, he believed, but he didn't trust Hashem, and he was arrogant, full of pride, and unrepentant. And this is what it means to be hikbati. That blue term you see there is insensible. Full of his own honor and not honoring Hashem. Does that describe him right there? Absolutely. In one word in the Hebrew describes exactly the position of Ha Satan. Pharaoh. It reads in Exodus Rabbah 13.3, Rabbi Shimon states, The Almighty warns a man once, twice, and even thrice. If he still does not repent, he says, Then does God close his heart Against repentance. So he already knew the outcome. How many warnings he gave him? More than three. He knew the outcome. He said, it's not that he took away his free will. Like some people say, whoa, how can God do this? They're taking away the free will of the people. Nonsense. Pharaoh never, never gave his heart. He did not lose his free will. He was just so full of himself, he had no room for Hashem. Beware not to fall into this trap. And beware from the pharaohs of the world. Hashem chose this method of delivering his message through his people. Like I said earlier, he promises to Abraham Avinu, and he knew the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. So he knew his people will apostatize. But he also had built up a plan of redemption in it. See? So he ultimately has always loved them. I always hear that people have a problem because, you know, those, um, those messianics are about the law and all this other stuff. We've been delivered from all that stuff. That's past. And a position that we were taught for many years. But here's our position with that. We don't do misvotes. We don't do all that we do because we have to but because we chose to and because we loved him. And because in doing so, we submit to him unlike Pharaoh. You see the difference of the way of those things in your life versus our ways. I started this with saying that his ways are not our ways. But we want to describe Hashem under our terms. Our own intellect, our own understanding. You're trying to describe an infinite. You remember? You're trying to put him in a box that we had discussed before. So he chose to do it through his people. But the people needed to first submit, first step. Salvation comes by. Grace. 
So you submit to Hashem. And you said, you are my Lord, forgive me of my sins. And now you have to trust Him so you can start walking in His statutes and in His commandments and in His instructions. Because this book, wrong reference, that's a computer, but <laughs> <laughs> this book was not made for people who are not in covenant with Hashem. It's our instructions for believers. So, submission, then you trust. And what's your action? Oh, I'm going to stay home and watch YouTube. That's my action. I'm going to learn a lot. There's no action in that. Knowledge is futile. Hebrew is a language of actions. That's why there's so many mitzvot. That's why there's so many actions. And Yeshua says, you, you got to walk. Don't stay there. Follow me. Walk. Walking is action. And it says that you have to have an expectation. That's why he gave promises. So that's how he chose to formulate his plan. We just have to get in line. And this all from just a couple of words here in the first two pasuks of Parashah Bo. We can go further. Not only did he did with Pharaoh, is everyone who was under his command. And this is why it's important to have good leaders. Leaders of countries. Leaders, like Aaron was saying, you remember what he said? Oh, many leaders were brought up on the prospect of bringing freedom, of the prospects of bringing equality, of the prospect of having basically all your needs being met because you were allowed to function in your special way to be able to obtain but what happens? It was just a trap. Because those same leaders will turn around and say, okay, now I will remove everything that was placed on you, and now you're subject to me. And you're enslaved. Simple. I will change your name. I will change your diet. I will change your location, and you'll become someone else. That's the Jewish people's history all the time. And every time we're exiled, and every time we run away from being at the hands of the Lord and doing His word, we're going that way. We're going that way. So just a couple of more minutes to indulge me here. Since I wanted to discuss a little bit on something that sometimes is overlooked, but you heard it here in the songs that they were singing uh, this afternoon. Anybody know what that word is? On the top. I know several of you know. But the word is Hoshech. And what does it mean? Darkness, some people say. Okay, darkness. Okay. But I always say that's a physical condition within the law of physics there's something greater right much greater the question is how many of you have experienced your power going off in the middle of the night where you're in the middle of some room they said whoops where am I going to go now oh happy last night oh, there you go and you don't have a little pilot light that comes out with a battery or something like that or an emergency light. And now all of a sudden, there's darkness. I'll tell you an account of my physical darkest day. Now everybody woke up. It really was underwater. And it really was at night. And doing underwater diving in a cave 
at night, it's a little bit dark, especially when there is no moon and you turn off the flashlight. And now you can't even see the hand in front. But you can sense the pressure of the water on you. Well, this is what it says here about this particular verse you're looking at here. Because it says, Then the Lord said to Moshe, Hold out your arm toward the sky, and there will be darkness upon the land of Egypt. Darkness that can be touched. That can be felt. Palpable darkness. What kind of darkness is that? That's not just any common darkness. That's like darkness upon darkness. Have you ever experienced dark darkness? Because that's not describing a physical darkness, but he's using physical descriptions. And that's what I'm trying to bring you. A darkness that it can be palpable. Now, you remember that feeling when that power went off, and you were like, I'm lost. I mean, I, I know the counter is over there, but how many steps? Boom! Oh, there goes the kneecap. <laughs> Oof, maybe it's a couple of steps shorter. Yeah, I remember those. Well, this is not it. We know that this Torah portion brings us through the last of the three strokes that comes against Egypt. The second to last one is found here in this particular verse. And we know that word being described here as Hoshech. The finest darkness. But it's told here twice, as you see there in blue. An emphasis being made on it. Not just to emphasize, obviously, this judgment that's coming against Egypt. But to emphasize those who oppose Hashem. Left in the order of strokes here as an example for everyone in history that reads the Bible to know and to attest. Why then the significance of this particular stroke? Why is it so significant? In a sense, you know, maybe the Egyptians can light up a lamp inside their house and they got power. Why do they have to bring it up in this fashion and make it so palpable as to what's happening here? So let's look. In Targum Onkelos, comments on this passage, it says, and when you like to go on a flight or on a dream and be awakened at the time of night. In other words, let's say we like to wake up to what? I like to say, oh, good morning, sunshine. Nobody wants to wake into darkness. Unless you work at night, and it's reverse. Mm -hmm. hmm? It's not quite normal. But what they're using here, what they're using there is that time of illustration, is that normally, if or when we go to bed at night, we like to wake up to sunshine, light. To come about. Okay. So following that, that thought, we go on to say that this might be considered a pleasant experience because you wake up expecting to see light and now not having it. Now remember the first question about losing the power, not finding yourself. It's like you're having an expectation and you are unable to obtain it. People could not see one another for three days. No one could get up from where he was. But all the Israelites enjoyed light in their dwellings. Now, we describe the darkness. It is palpable. But this darkness is about death. This darkness is about separation. From what? From light. That's the bottom line of what this description 
here, found. Is this verse 3? Three days? Three nights. What's three days and three nights? Death. Because it's after three days and three nights, there's no resurrection. You're dead. Really dead. Seventy-two hours of separation. This is not unlike sin. It separates us unto death and keeps us in darkness. In a sense, this is alluding to spiritual death before being awakened. Before the resurrection, if you're in darkness, you will awake the separation. More darkness. In the book of Job, chapter 10, verse 20 through 22, it reads, Are not my yamim few or my days few? Then cease and let me alone, that I may take a little cheer before I go from where I shall not return. Even to the Erez Hoshech, the land of darkness, and of Bethal Mavet, and of the dead. The land of darkness, like darkness itself. Here we find that term twice again. This death that is disorderly, it says in this particular um, translation, it says, no sedarim, has no seder, no order, where the light, the light is like darkness. Whoa. The light is like darkness. What kind of light is that? You know what this is called in Judaism? And Judaism calls this place Gehenna. Or a destination of the wicked. They even have a name for it. This is a destination of unrepented souls that are totally separated from Hashem and cannot return to Him until they are totally cleansed from their impurities. This is a place of the accursed, equivalent to what our modern minds might think hell. And a place synonymous to a place in the south of Jerusalem where children were sacrificed to Moloch, the valley of Hinnon, Gainon, the valley of death. Meanwhile, in Goshen, as stated here, Israel had lights, like in Psalm 27 1 Adonai is my light and my salvation. Whom do I need to fear? Like in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my foot and a light unto my path. Just like Moshe came in and brought the darkness into Egypt, which he did at the command of Hashem, Yeshua, the Messiah, will come and bring the darkness of judgment to the wicked and light to his people. Israel. Now, in Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, he says, Arise, shine, Jerusalem, for your light has come. What's the light? Messiah. The glory of Adonai has risen over you, for although darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness, here it is twice again, the people, on you, Adonai, will rise, Messiah, over you will be seen his glory. Nations will go towards your light and kings towards your shining splendor. Earlier, the passage in the Brit HaDasah, Yohanan 8.12 was read. And it reads in the Orthodox Jewish Bible. It says, Then again he spoke to them saying, Ani hu hachor haolam haseh. I am the light of the world. The one following me will never walk in Hoshech, 
Darkness. But we'll have what? See the difference? The light that gives life. I just told you a minute ago where the Gahina is. It's the light unto death. This is a different light. This is the light of the Messiah. Now, there is much more in this Torah portion, obviously, that we can get into. And there's much more that we can get from uh, Passover and everything that's instituted. What else is instituted at the beginning of the months? Rosh Kodesh. It's instituted in this Torah portion. Where is that word Kodesh comes? The root word is what? Kadash. Hadashah. Hadashah. See, it's new or renew. The beginning of the month is established here. It's a renewal in Exodus 12, 12 uh, 2. Israel is coming into a new thing, a new observation, a new position that will set them apart from those who came before them and connect them for those who are to follow. Yes, that is the Passover. The Passover events, the exodus from Egypt, came after this judgment passed over this nation and death came unto the firstborns and the land was stripped from his riches. So the question is which light do you have the expectation when you wake up? In the resurrection. Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you for you are faithful. You've shown us time and time again how you have guarded your people like the apple of your eye. That you have brought us, Father, through Many, many, many trials that you have brought us just only to protect those who have been faithfully, faithfully following you. And although we don't merit any of the things that you have given us, you have given us mercy and you have brought us into your fold. I thank you for that privilege. I thank you for all those who have here that have made the decision to follow you. Father, may their heart will always be pure towards you and may they may always pursue you with all their strength and all their might. I thank you and we love you. B'Shem Yeshua, we pray. Amen. 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 So we'll do the bracha and dismiss. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Is Adonai Panavelecha Yasem Lecha Shalom. In the name of Yeshua Mishikin was Shalom. Amen. Well, it's not quite Pesach yet, so this is not the bread of affliction. This is our <laughs> hallows for today. Everyone, Baruch Atalona, Yelohin Melech Haolam, Hamot Silechem in Hadet. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for coming.